So we're going to talk now about rational inequalities, and we're going to first set the denominator to zero on these. And when we go to graph these, it's going to have a parenthesis, no matter what, irregardless of whether it's greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, that one has parentheses because it can't work because that's division by zero. For the second part, what we do is we clear the fractions. And we solve. Now that critical point can either have square brackets or it can have parentheses, depending upon the sign. And then what we do is when we plot our critical points, just like we did earlier, and then we check each region and we shade the true ones. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to check each region and we're going to shade the true region. And we're going to start off here with a really, really easy one. So we're going to start with this one here. Now, this is a rational inequality, and it's rational because my x is down below. So anytime you have an x in the denominator, it makes it a rational inequality. And so the first thing we have to do is we set our denominator to zero. And this is our denominator. So we're going to go ahead and set this to zero. So we've got 5x equals zero. So then our first one is x equals zero. And on these, we want to go ahead and label whether it gets brackets or parentheses at the very beginning. So that one's going to have parentheses. Now we clear the fractions. So now we, we go on to step two. So this was step one. For step two, we clear these fractions. And so we'll make this an equal sign so we can easily solve it. I'm just going to make this an eight over one. You'll see why in a moment. So I just made that an eight over one there. And now we can kind of know what to do. Uh, this was pretty easy. We can use cross multiplication, can't we? And so when we cross multiply, we have... 5 times 8, that makes it a 40x. And then 1 times 4, we multiply across as a 4. We divide by our 40, and then we can reduce it down. And we get x now equals 1 tenth. And that one is going to have square brackets. And why does it have square brackets? It has square brackets because the original here was less than or equal to. So that's why that one has square brackets. Now, in some cases, when we check these, we're going to have to be using decimals because there may not be a whole number in between them. So let's put these on a number line. And we've got 0 as our first one, and we've got 1 tenth our second. And again, we've got our regions. Now, if possible, pick whole numbers, but there's a, a region that we can't use a whole number on. So region number one is back here, and it's less than zero. So that's easy. We'll use a negative one. It's less than zero. However, in between these two, there's no whole number in there. And that's 0 0.1, right? 1 tenth is 0 0.1. So how about we check x equals 0 0.05? Because there's no whole number in there, and it's got to be between 0 and a tenth. And you could use 0 0.01 if you wanted to as well, or you can use 0 0.05. It just has to be in between here and between those two. And then we need a number bigger than 0 0.1, 1 
Well, how about one? One is bigger, so that's going to be easy for us to use. But we just have to make sure that it fits in the criteria, fits in between those in those regions. And now we check them, and when we check them, we check them back in our original, which was this. So that's what we're going to be checking them in. And they're pr fairly easy to check as well. I mean, you could just kind of look at them and tell if it's true or false, so you can actually work it out the entire way. Um, this one's pretty easy because we've got the negative here. So this side is a negative 4 fifths. And is negative 4 fifths, is that going to be bigger than 8? No, negative 4 fifths is clearly not bigger than 8. So that means that is false, so that region is false. Now we try it again with that 0 0.05. So this one we check with x equals negative 1. Now we're going to check with x equals 0 0.05. Let me write it right here. So we've got 8 is less than or equal to. We're going to plug in our 0 0.05. on the top. Now down below, watch your decimals when you multiply here. We've got 5 times 0 0.05 and that's 0 0.25 and now when we divide, look what happens. 4 divided by 0 0.25, that's 16. And is 16 bigger than 8? Yes it is. So that means this half is true. Or that piece is true. And then we do the 1. And 1 is probably going to be false because normally they switch back and forth. But again, not always. So you have to check. So let's let's plug in this 1. All right, if I plug in 1, then I get 8 is less than or equal to 4 over 5 times 1. And that's 4 fifths. And is 4 fifths bigger than 8? Nope, that would be then false. Okay. Now, when we go to shade these, we have to make sure that we know which one gets which. So when we look to the zero, okay, if we go back up, and I'll, I'll try to keep as much on here as I can. When we go back up and look at the zero, so here's our number line. When we go back up and look at our zero, zero gets parentheses, right? And your one-tenth got square bracket. So that means 0 gets the parentheses and 1 tenth gets the brackets. And our answer is going to be in between. Okay, so what's our answer now in interval notation? Well, it is parentheses 0, comma, 1 tenth with the square bracket. There's your answer. Now let's do one more of these, and then we will look at how to handle these applications. So let's look at one more of these. The rational ones are really no different than the quadratics. Just one extra different step. Let's look at one more, and I'll make one up kind of like what you got in your, your homework here. So this is going to look very, very similar to question 9 in your homework. So that's going to be like question 9 in your homework. I just changed the numbers, but pretty much kept everything else the same. This one's actually a little bit easier than the last one. It's a little bit different. And you're not always going to get two critical points. You may just get one. But let's see what we've got here. So step number one is we set our denominator to zero. Okay. 
Now, this is a quantity squared. So like any other quantity squared, we can get rid of that by taking the square root. And we don't have to worry about the plus or minus because when we take the square root of zero, well, zero doesn't have a sign at all. So the square root of zero is simply zero. And what about the left-hand side? Well, the square and the square root, those cancel. And that leaves you then with an x plus four. Okay, and now we'll just move that four over with subtraction. And now we have our first critical point, which is a negative four. Is everyone kind of okay with that? And that one gets parentheses, no matter what. Why? Because it came from the denominator. If it comes from the denominator, it's going to get parentheses. Now we need to go ahead and try to solve this. So now we're going to clear our fractions. And we may only have one critical point. Right? So I'm going to go ahead and make that equal. And it's going to equal that zero. Okay? And we may only have one critical point because when I cross multiply, We're in luck because when I cross multiply, 8 times 1 is an 8, and 0 just absorbs all of that, so that's 0. And 8 can equal 0, right? So we only have one critical point. So because of that 0, we only have one critical point. And now, when we put these on the number line, we only have one critical point to check, but we still have to check both sides. So the only critical point that we have is this negative 4, and we do have to check both sides. So I'm going to check negative 5, that's smaller, and I'm also going to check, how about negative 3, that's smaller as well. Okay, Just in between, right, that negative 4, you could also have picked 0, doesn't matter. You just have to pick a number that's smaller and one that's larger. But it doesn't matter what number you pick. So now, let's see what we've got. On each one, we're going to check it back in the original. So we're going to check these back in our original. So there's our original, and we're going to check these, and we're going to plug in this negative 5 first. So we're going to check this negative 5, and we're going to see what we've got here. Now with these, we need to remember what happens when we square a negative. Well, when we square a negative, does it stay negative, or does it become positive? When we square that negative 1 down below, well, that negative 1 is going to be a positive 1, right? So then that is simply 8 over 1, which is 8. And is 8 now smaller than 0? Is that true or is that false? Is 8 going to be smaller than 0? False. False, okay? So that piece is false. Now we repeat the process with the negative 3. And minus 3 plus 1 is a 1. And 1 squared still stays positive, so that just comes out to an 8 again. And is 8 less than 1? Or sorry, less than 0. Is 8 less than 0? Nope, that's false as well. And this can happen. Okay, notice both of these are false. Now, what are we trying to look for? We're looking for the true regions, and this can happen. If they both come out to be false on our number line, then what does that tell me? We have no true regions, right? So that means it's all false, so we have no solution. Okay, so no true regions, that means we have no solution.
If they were both true, then it would be everything. Then it would be negative to positive infinity. But in this case, they're both false, so that means we have no solution. But you still had to check both sides up. Now, I'm going to help you set up these applications. But you're going to have to solve them yourself. So I'll set up the, the four applications from your homework. We'll talk about them a little bit, but I'm going to leave them for you to actually do. But we're not going to spend a lot of time on them. I'm just going to set them up, and you're going to have to solve them. For the first question, we're talking about profit. And when I talk about profit, well, profit is the revenue minus the cost to produce an item. Now, in many cases, the more items you produce, the more money you make. But not always, because sometimes if I want to produce more items, I may have to build a bigger factory, and that might actually cost me more money. So you might, you might actually think about it, is it really worth it to expand the factory to make more parts if I'm going to start losing money? Have to hire new employees. Maybe I'm better off just sticking with, with making this number of parts instead of trying to build a new factory to make more and actually make less money, if that makes sense, less profit. So what we're going to try and look at here is we're going to try to see our profit. So we've got a cost and we've got a revenue. And we want to make sure we make a profit. And so we want the profit, we want that to be greater than or equal to zero because we want to make sure we make money. And our profit is equal to the revenue minus the cost. So that's your profit. And this goes along with question four. And what we want in question four is we want our profit to be greater than or equal to zero. That's what we want. We want to make sure we make money. So that profit had better be bigger than zero, no matter what. And so when we look at these, we've got our cost. And so our cost in this case is 3t squared plus 5t. And our revenue is 4t squared. So we're going to go ahead now and look at our profit. Remember, our profit is the revenue minus the cost. And we want this to be bigger than 0. So that is then 4t squared minus, use parentheses here, 3t squared plus 5t. And we want to make sure we make money, so that's got to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, you're going to have to finish this. And we have to remember about t. t is units sold. So T can never be negative, right? That means you can ignore the negative regions. So we don't even have to worry about the negative region, and we're going to start at zero. when we look at the number line. Okay, so we can't have negative and negative value of t because t can can't be negative, why not? Because t is units and you can't have a negative number of units sold. It doesn't make sense. Now, it might be when you work this out, you get a negative negative part on your number line and you don't even have to worry about that region, right? 
So you will, in this case, get one region that starts at zero. So the back region you can skip. You don't have to worry about it. Why not? Because it can't be negative. So there'll be three regions, but one of the regions is negative, and you can just cross it off at the very beginning because T can't be negative. Question four is just simply plugging the numbers in. And so question four, or, or sorry, question five here says a coin is tossed upward from a balcony that is 210 feet tall. Initial velocity is 48 feet per second. During what time on this interval, will the coin be at least 50 feet in the air? Okay. So let's think about what we're doing. We're throwing a coin up in the air, and we want it to be at least 50 feet in the air. So here's your equation for the height. So it's minus 16 t squared plus v naught t plus h naught, and we want this to be at least 60 feet. So it's got to be great, or sorry, 50 feet. So it's got to be greater than or equal to the 50. And it's going to start off above that, and eventually it's going to go down. That's what's happening. Now, same thing as the last one, that t can't be negative, right? Because that's time again. So if you get a negative region, disregard it which you will. Now we need to figure out what the pieces are. Okay. V naught, that's going to be the starting speed. So starting speed or starting velocity. And in our case, in this question, it looks like that initial velocity is 48 feet per second. So that's going to be 48 then. And H naught is a starting height. And our starting height, we're starting, it says, on a balcony that is 210 feet in the air. So that means my H naught is 210. And so now I'm going to leave this for you to finish. I'm just going to plug my values in. And I'm going to leave this for you to finish. Now, while you, while you write that down, what does that minus 16 represent? That, of course, if you're throwing something up in the air, it has to come back down. So that minus 16, that is the effects of gravity. And that's in feet per second. If you take a physical science class, you use 9.8 because that's in meters per second. And most things are done in meters per second, not feet per second. But that 16 is feet per second in the English units. Most other countries would be 9.8 because that's the effects of gravity in the, the metric system, the imper imperial system. Or sorry, we work on the imperial system, but that, that's going to be on the standard system. So 9.8, you'd see in a, in a, in a uh, physical science or a physics class would be the effects of gravity under the standard system, we use a lot of times the imperial system, and so ours is the 16. And it's negative, why? Because it pulls it down. So that's why that gravity in that case is negative. If you're on the moon, it'd be a different number. The moon has a different value of gravity. Okay. Question six, I'm going to set up for you as well. And large companies run through the math about something like this. So they, they have data and they look at things and they know the more that you reduce the price on an item, the more of that item you're going to sell. But you can't, you can't lower it too much because then you won't make any money. So there's the balancing act. Where do I set that price? so that I make the maximum amount of money that I want to make. 
because the more that I reduce it, the more I'm going to sell. But is that really beneficial? Or is it become you're not making much money off of each item and you're selling a lot, but it just isn't, isn't as beneficial as leaving the price higher? So big stores like Walmart and Target, things like that, they run the numbers. They know what they can do, and they know if I reduce the price by so much, I sell this many items. But they have to figure out what's, what's the break-even point. Where do I make the most money? So a retailer knows that they can sell number of games per month is 20 minus 0.2 in dollars. Okay, N is the number of games. So as I as I decrease the price, then that changes the number of games that I sell. He buys the games for four dollars and he wishes to make a profit of at least three hundred dollars per month on the sales of the games. How many games must he sell each month to make sure we get a profit of that three hundred dollars? So very similar to the last one. Well, not the last one. Uh, question four. In this case, we want the profit to be at least 300. So that my profit is going to be greater than or equal to 300. And again, we know the profit is the revenue minus the cost. And this one's a little bit trickier to understand how it's set up, but we're going to talk about it. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is the revenue. And what's the revenue defined by? Well, the revenue is how many games I sell, right? And I take the number of games that I sell times the price of that game, and then that's my revenue. So if I sold 10 games and they were $4 a piece, I made $40. Okay? So that's the price times the number of games. Now, in this case, the price can change because that's going to change how many games I sold. So when I talk about the price, the price in this case is 20 minus 0.2 in. That's going to be your price. And how many games did I sell? Well, I don't know, so I'm going to use an in to represent the game sold. So there's your revenue. That's your R. Because there's your price. And the price is not a fixed price. The price is variable. I can change this all I want. But when I change the price, I change the number of games that I sell. So I decrease the price. I sell more games. Increase the price. I sell less games. But it might be better off sometimes to raise the price to sell less games and make more of a markup. Now what about the cost? Now the cost is a fixed cost. And so each game costs me $4 to buy. So each game costs $4. Unknown amount of games, so that's an N. And then we want this to be now greater than or equal to 300. So again, you can finish it from here. Is there any way you can work one of these out? Because I don't even know where to begin to even finish it. Sure, sure. I can go ahead and finish this one out. Okay, so this one's pretty easy to, to finish. We're going to go ahead first and distribute this, this N through. So that's going to be 20N minus 0.2N squared minus 4N is greater than or equal to 300. Okay, so all I did there was I just distributed that in through. And now we'll clean it up a little bit. We're going to have to set this to zero eventually too. So when I rewrite this, I got a minus 0.2n squared. And then I'm going to put the 20n and the minus 4n together. And that's going to make it a positive 16n. And that's greater than or equal to 300. And we don't really want to, to work with decimals because they're harder to factor. And we, and we don't want it to be negative either 
So I'm going to go ahead and clear out my fraction, my decimals, and get rid of that negative. So I'm going to multiply it all by a negative 10. Now, when we go back to check, we're going to check here. Okay, so we're going to check in that piece. This is where we're going to check. And we'll go ahead and make this equal since we're going to solve. And so I'm going to go ahead and distribute that negative 10 through. And that's going to give me then negative and negative makes it a positive 2n squared. We've got a minus 160n. And the other side makes it a minus 3,000. We're going to go ahead and add that 3,000 over. And now we should kind of know what to do, right? Okay. Numbers are big, but that's okay. And always, always, before I do anything else, I look at all the numbers together. I have a 2, I have a 16, and I have a 3,000. So what do they all have in common? In this case, they all have what in common? They all have a 2 in common, don't they? Okay. And that should be a minus 160 there. I, I messed up. Because when I multiply by 10, that should be a 160 minus stick there. I just wasn't careful. Right? Because when I multiplied, that becomes the 2 there. Negative times a positive 16 makes it a minus 160. So make sure we see it's a minus 160 there. And now we can divide everything by a 2. It's going to make my numbers much smaller and much easier to deal with. It also makes sure we don't have to do factor by grouping. Okay. So now it's easy. And now remember, we've done ones like this before. First times the last is the 1,500. Well, what do I know here? Look, I've got the double zeros again, don't I? So we did one of these earlier, way back in a, in a previous section. And let's cover up the zeros. What two numbers are going to multiply together to give me 15, add together to give you 8, negative 8 in this case? Okay, and in this case they're the same, so they're both going to be negative. Negative 5. And three. Now that's got a double zero, so we're going to split this up into 50 and 30, right? So 50 and 30 gives you 80. So whenever you have a double zero, you can split it up and make it easier on yourself. And I just saw, okay, well, that's easy enough there. I split the zero up in half, and I got my 50 and my 30. And now I've got them. And minus 50 and minus 30. So n minus 50 equals 0. So n equals 50. And minus 30 equals 0. Because n equals then 30. We're not done yet because these have to go in the number. Now, we don't even have to worry about anything past zero. So we're just going to put the zero. We're going to put an x there because we can't have a negative number of units sold, right? So there's your zero. Now, let's take for a moment this problem and let's think about what's happening with it. We're going to talk about what our answer should be, and then I'm going to show you that it's the same when we work it out mathematically. So if I don't sell any units, do I make any money? No. Okay, now there is a point at which when I start to, to change the price, I start making more money. And I eventually want to get to where I make at least $300. So this should go up here, starting here at, at zero. It should, we should make any money, so this should be false, all the way to 30. Now once it hits 30, that's probably a break-even point. So that's where you start making the money. You start making $300 a month. Now what happens if I start adjusting the price? Okay, if I start adjusting the price, I make more money because I sell more games, right? But I make less money in each game. Now, eventually what happens? Eventually what happens is I make the, the price too low. And then I don't even make my $300 a month because now I've set the price too low. 
even though I'm selling more games, my profit margin is way down. So then it goes false. So it should go false, true in the middle, false on the end. We're going to check it and we're going to see and verify that it is correct. So let's check, um, and we got n here instead of it next. Let's check a number in each region. So let's now check how about 1, that's in there. How about 31, and how about 51? And we're going to see what happens with each of these. Now, if I don't sell any units, the first one should be false, right? Because if I don't sell very many units, I don't make that $300. I need to make at least that $300. If I make more, that's great. But I have to have at least that $300. If I check and only sell one unit, I'm not going to make $300. But we're going to check it and see. And we're going to check it in this. So we're going we're gonna to check it in here. We're going to use that n equals 1. If I plug in 1, in there, then I have 20 minus 0 0.2, and that's going to come out to be 19.8. 4 times 1 is, of course, that 4. And if I if I make that price, and, and or sorry, if I sell in n equals 1 units, that means what I'm doing is I'm making this unit cost $19.80. And if I make it $19.80, I only sell one of them, and I don't make much money because I only make 15.8. And is 15.8 bigger than that, 30, that 300? No. So it's false, right? I don't make much money because I've got the price set too high. So now let's try it when I adjust the price to 31. Or not, not price, the number of units sold to 31. Let's say I want to sell 31 units. So I, I adjust the price so that I should sell 31 units. Okay, so I'm going to plug my values in. And that's 31 times 13.8, it looks like. That's 4 times that 31. So what does that 13.8 represent? That tells me now I've adjusted my price to be $13.80. So I'm going to sell those games for $13.80. And if I sell them for $13.80, then I should be able to sell 31 games. And if I do that and I work it all out, I should make $303.80. And is that more than the $300 that I need? Yes. So as long as I sell more than 30 games, it's true. But what happens if I adjust my price too much? And let's say I try to sell 51 games. Now remember, to sell more games, I'm constantly decreasing the price, but the price I buy the games for stays fixed. So let's see what happens here. Okay, so 20 Original price is $20. I'm going to take off 
0.2 times that 51, because I'm trying to sell 51 games. So I reduced that price down to $9.80. And if I reduce that down to $9.80 for the price, and I work it all out, I end up making or sorry, $295.80. And is that greater than $300? No, that's false. So what happens? I reduced the price too much, didn't I? So I don't make any money. And the more you decrease that, that price, eventually it's just not feasible. So where should I set the price at or number of units sold at? To make sure I make $300, I should set the price so that I sell between 30 and 50 units. If I sell between 30 and 50 units, I'm making that $300 profit. And if I don't sell the 30, if I make the, the price too high and I don't sell my 30 units, I don't make that $300. But yet if I make it too low, I sell a lot more, but it's just not feasible for me to make it that low. At a certain point, you're just losing money by setting the price too low. But you do sell more, but it, it counteracts that difference. So now do you kind of understand why I'd be in the middle, right? Because you can set that price too low and not, not make enough to make money. You can set the price too high and not make money either. You want it to be in that magic spot. And that's what Walmart, Target, big retail stores, they know and they've got enough data to see if I, if I decrease this price, I sell more units. But at the same time, if I decrease it too much, my profit margin goes down for each one and I don't make enough money. So it's always a balancing game. You know, they use years and years worth of data to make these kind of decisions, but that's what they do. They actually do formulas like that, more complicated, but in the same type of thing. The computer analyzes it and says, okay, we need to make sure we sell this many items here, and this is what we set the price at to make sure we get that. Let's set up question seven, and then we'll take a break, come back, and look at absolute values. And we should be able to get through absolute values today, I hope. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at a flare, and we're going to fire the flare from the bottom of the gorge, and it's only going to be visible when we're above the rim. If it is fired with an initial velocity of 144 feet per second and the gorge is 288 feet deep, during what interval can the flare be seen? Okay, so now, V0, that represents that starting speed. So how much power is put behind this, this flare? Well, this flare, it started out at 144 feet per second. So that's going to be your V, naught. And whenever they have a naught or a zero below, that just means your starting speed, starting velocity. H0, now we have to be careful, because when we talk about this flare, I'm not starting at 288 feet because I'm down below. So I'm down in the ground. So that means my initial height is actually a negative 288 because I'm below ground. I'm in, in a valley below okay, in this gorge. So I'm down below and I'm going to shoot this flare up. So it's down below. Now I cannot see it until my height is greater than zero. Because I'm on top looking, looking at it, and I can't see it until that thing crosses the horizon. So let's go ahead and rewrite the equation here. And I know I'm going to do the setup on this one pretty quickly, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time to come back and finish up 1A. 
And so I want this to now be, I need to be able to see it, so it has to be greater than zero. And you can finish it from here, just like we did the last one. And can you have negative values for t? No. no. Why is that 288 negative? Because you're down below. You're in a hole in the ground, in, in the gorge. So you're down below in a valley. And you can't see it. Think about like a rocket ship. So, or a rocket. So this, this rocket is down below where it's fired from. You can't see it underground being fired. So you can't see the rocket until it hits ground level here. And then you can see it go up, and it's going to come back down. So if you think about it when, it, when it comes out, it should be false, because you can't see it until it breaks ground level. True in the middle, and then false at the end, because that's where it hits the ground. So it should go false, true, false. But work it out and make sure. Let's try to take a short break. And let's just try to take a short five-minute break. We'll come back, and we'll try to finish up 1-8 today. So let's take about a five-minute break, and let's meet back here at, um, how about, 1040. So let's try to be back here at 1040, and that should give us enough time to finish up 1-8.